I think it's uh, a good time to get started. So uh, many of you are still here from the previous talk, which was on uh, Professor Goddard's efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now he's going to talk about his research works. So in addition to his deanship um, or associate deanship in DEI at UIUC, he's also a professor in electrical and computer engineering. Um, he has over 200 publications and 15 patents in this area and is a fellow of both SPIE and Optica. So um, please help me in welcoming Professor Goddard. On. So thank you, Rob. And again, thank you for the SPIE invitation, the chapter to be able to have me here. It's a great privilege to be able to talk to you both about our DEI efforts, but also about our research in in-ship volumetric photonic integrated circuits. Um, and so we have a familiar face um, in a group of students. Um, so these are graduate students from my research group, plus Paul, Bra Paul Braun's research group, Kimani Toussaint, and also Mark Brongersma. Um, but we have Wait, he left. Oh, no. He left, but um, he was one of the contributors um, when he was an undergrad at Illinois. So um, today it's going to be talking about in-ship vo volumetric photonic integrated circuits um, versus on-ship uh, on the surface. So the outline for what I want to talk to you about today is just our overall vision of volumetric photonic integrated circuits. Where do we want to eventually end up with this technology? Um, then I'll present about our new fabrication method, which everything has to have a good acronym. So our acronym is SCRIBE, Subsurface Controllable Refractive Index, uh, with, uh, via beam exposure. Um, so it's a method where we control the local 3D refractive index and therefore the geometry inside a mesoporous structure. Um, I'll talk about some of the compound micro-optic elements that we've made. So these include achromatic doublets and photonic nanojet generators. Um, and then talk about more of the GRIN elements, so gradient refractive index, so planar axicons, spherical Lunenburg lenses, um, microcylinder lens arrays, and so forth. And then I'll get into the thing that I'm the most excited about, but others in the group are a little bit less excited about. They're more excited about the lenses. Um, our, our passive volumetric photonic integrated circuits. So we've been able to demonstrate 3D waveguides, um, low loss, and be able to make um, microring resonators, mock center interferometers, and the typical things that you would get when you build things on surface, but we have the ability to do it in 3D volume. And then I'll get into some conclusions and future outlook. So grand vision, we want to build multifunctional optical interconnects that are three dimensions. Um, the problem statement is we want to be able to route data efficiently between a transmitter and a receiver. So we're going to have a transmitter chip, which might have an array of vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, a receiver chip that has a bunch of photodiodes. And in between, we want to do magic. So we want to create these circuits that have, for example, um, diffractive optic, I think I can, well, it's a little bit high. Um, diffractive optical elements to be able to control like the polarization or the uh, mode shape or the coherent properties of the vertical cavity laser so that these act as external cavities that do wavelength, mode, and polarization selection. We want to be able to take the light and efficiently couple it into waveguides, so having coupling lenses and then 3D waveguides. We want to be able to have other diffractive optical elements that do things like splitting the light into different photodetectors that are going to receive the signal. And we want to build all of these components on a single chip. So we want to be able to make this sort of interconnect that's able to do this functionality. And at some point, ideally, we also want to make the transmitters and receivers in this material. But that's kind of like 20 years down the line type vision. OK, so how does our method work? Um, so standard methods to make um, uh, uh, volumetric devices um, include ultra-fast laser inscription, where you take a glass and you write with a high laser power uh, beam um, uh, voxels that are on the order of a few tens of microns in size. So you make local damage to the glass substrate, and you scan the beam um, through it, and you can make these sorts of waveguides. The challenge is that in this material, the refractive index contrast that you can get is relatively low, on the order of 10 to the minus 3 to 0 0.06. And therefore, because the index contrast is not that large, you can't take the light and make tight bends with it because you'll lose the light um, 
uh, uh, from the waveguide. So you're limited to millimeter size bends. These are some of the early results um, on, on the sort of method. And you can see you can make these sort of 20 micron uh, waveguides in size. Instead, with our method, Scribe, what we do is we're not modifying the material. Instead, we have a nanoporous host. So this is silicon that we've porosified to about 70 to 80% air. Inside this porous region, we fill it with polymer. So we cross-link the polymer and we can create printed optics that have high refractive index contrast compared to the pores. So we can get index contrast on the order of 0.4 to 0.6, and therefore it's similar to materials like silicon nitride that have that sort of index contrast. You can make relatively tight bends on the order of 20 microns without having significant amounts of loss. Additionally, we can write lenses because we have large enough index contrast that we can do some serious focusing um, inside the material. So here are some examples. Um, this is a multi-photon fluorescence image. So when we write the material, we cross-link polymer. The polymer can still fluoresce. And so where we get bright intensity means that we have large amounts of polymer cross-linked. So on glass substrate, so we transfer the porous films onto glass substrates. Um, we can write these sorts of uh, uh, refractive index profiles that are kind of suspended in this um, mesoporous structure. So they don't need supports to hold them in place. They just sit inside the pores and they can be cross-linked at any location. And then we have air on top. This is a cross-sectional slice of one of our, um, our, our hyperbolic lenses um, where we take the SEM and you can kind of see the written region is here. You can see some of the pore structure going vertically because the pores form vertically. Um, and then this region is just porous silicon. So the porous silicon, the index is about, um, if it's porous silicon, the index is about 1.2. The written material is about 1.7-ish. Um, if this was porous silica, because sometimes we oxidize, um, we'd get an index of about 1.15 and about 1.55. So we can make these structures um, uh, very small. We can make the structures um, have refractive index profiles that, um, that vary, and we can stack optical elements and therefore form systems. So some of the fabrication steps in our process, it starts off with a highly doped P-type silicon wafer, and we put it in an electrochemical etch where we apply a pulse of current. The current density de generates or determines the porosity. So the higher current density we apply, um, the more we get this wet chemical etch process in which we need holes. So that's why we need P-type material. Um, we get holes that participate in the etching process in the HF, and that creates this porous structure from the top down. So as we apply current, we get the sort of pores starting forming. They're completely random. They're on the order of 50 nanometers in size. And if we change the current, we can change the porosity as we etch. So we can actually vary the porosity as a function of height. So the first step, we have our silicon wafer. Um, we porosify the silicon, and we get the 70 to 85% air um, porous region. The second step is we can do a uh, transfer process where we essentially cut out the porous region, and we can transfer this thin film onto any other substrate we want. Um, the films typically range from 10 microns thick to about 60 microns thick. That's sort of the target thickness that we aim for. And we've transferred it onto glass, onto um, other types of substrates. Um, so it's, it's a readily easy, or it's an easy process in which the film just floats. So there's a cutting step and then it's a washing step and it floats the film off and you can get it to stick to other materials. So optionally, we transfer it to, to quartz. Actually, we do this about 90, 95% of the time because most of the times we're gonna test it on a station where we wanna be able to access the light from the bottom as well as from the top, whereas the silicon wafer itself would be absorbing. The next step is we can optionally oxidize it to change the porous silicon into porous silica. So the porous silica is nice because it's transparent and the visible. It's also um, lower refractive index con or lower refractive index, so that we can make the porous region have a lower index overall. Um, the next step is we have our substrate and we have this either oxidized or unoxidized film on it. We get the photoresist inside the pores. So the pores are like a sponge and it just soaks up this um, liquid monomer. So this vacuum casting process gets the resist, it's low viscosity resist inside the pores. 
And then we use a femtosecond laser to do direct laser writing. So the tool that we use is actually called a NanoScribe. So our acronym is actually reinforcing how we're doing it. Um, so the NanoScribe company, um, they, their, their tool, um, femtosecond laser at 780 nanometers, um, absorption from a two photon process. So it's a nonlinear absorption process. And so where the beam focuses the tightest, that's where you get the cross-linking of the resist. We end up with voxels that are cross-linked on the order of 150 by 150 in X and Y, and 500 nanometers in tall. It's asymmetric because when you focus light in the Gaussian beam, the intensity profile, the contours are uh, elliptical shape. Also, the pore structure tends to uh, affect the size of the voxels as well. So we do this direct laser right exposure, and we create patterns of uh, voxels um, that are going to be where there's polymer. And then where we want to get rid of the polymer, we just use a development step and rinse away the polymer that's been not cross-linked. So the resist is a negative resist. You shine light on it. Where you shine light, it cross-links and it stays. So the types of things that we can do, um, so this is showing the formation of a Lunenburg lens. The Lunenburg lens has high refractive index in the very center. It's a spherically symmetric structure. Um, and this is like a cross-sectional view of us writing layer by layer to create this, um, this structure. So what we can make, we can make geometrical optics, so things that have constant refractive index but a geometrical shape. We can make grin optics. We change the refractive index as a function of position. We can make compound optics where we have two different uh, optical uh, dispersion curves. And we can make integrated photonics where we have both like a lens and also waveguides that are going in 3D. So some of the first steps are we want to be able to quantify and understand how the laser writing process affects the refractive index. So we need to do a lot of calibration studies and be able to see the quality of the things that we write. So we use multi-photon fluorescence imaging to get three-dimensional images of the local refractive index through measurements of essentially the polymer density. So we take these images and where it's the brightest, so these are exposures at three different laser powers. Where it's the brightest, that means we have the highest density of cross-linked polymer. And by some form of effective index type model, we assume that that means we have the highest refractive index, which we then confirm with other types of measurements. So we can write cylinders, prisms, and these are just rectangular shapes just to see that we can change the intensity of the fluorescence based on the laser power that we write. So what we can do now um, are make certain types of devices. So the first device set that we uh, made um, uh, back in like 2018, because the paper came out in 2020, but this work is like several years worth of work. Um, we started out with a distributed Bragg reflector stack. So we have alternating layers with different porosity, and that's what makes this DBR stack. We fill the entire thing with the polymer, and then in the regions that we write, depending on the laser power that we write, we change the effective index in that region. So we have a DBR stack, and in this DBR stack, if we write it at a different laser power, we get a different refractive index, therefore it reflects a different color. So we can essentially write DBRs of different reflectivity, so we get different colors depending on the laser power that we use to write. And you can see that we can go all the way from the blue to the sort of orangish color, and this is, one of the students holding up a U of I logo um, on one of the chips. So that's kind of a demonstration of like what we could possibly do. Now we wanna talk about the ways that we characterize and understand exactly what it is we write. Um, so we write at different laser powers, these voxels, and we get hundreds of these images. We take cross-sectional SEM. Um, this looks kind of grainy to me, and I'm always impressed like how you look at an image like this and determine the height and the width of the voxel. We go through various uh, computer methods to uh, approximate this and do some fitting, um, and there's enough data that we can average to, to get sort of the dimensions. But what we typically see is that as a function, oh, my laser pointer go, um, as a function of the laser power, so this is the average laser power of the writing laser, which is the parameter that you set on the tool. Although the more important parameter is like the peak power, because this is a two photon nonlinear process, um, but they're both proportional to each other. So we measure things as a function of the power that we set. Um, as we increase the power, essentially the voxel gets bigger because you're exposing a certain region is as you increase the power, you increase more of the region that has uh, power above the threshold for cross-linking. So you end up with bigger voxels with more power that you apply. 
So the size of the voxel can be on the order of 250 to 500 nanometers in size. Um, this is for porous silicon. And if we oxidize it to porous silica, we get a different graph of the, the size. But the general trend is that um, the voxels in X and Y are on the order of like 200 to 300 nanometers. And in Z, they can be um, much bigger. So that's the individual voxel. Now we want a method to measure the refractive index of the things that we write. So the method that we're using is to make a Fresnel biprism. The advantage of this is we want to be able to have a way to measure the refractive index rather than something like the group index or the effective index that you would get if you measure a photonic waveguide type device. So we're using just standard ray tracing and um, Snell law type calculations. You can figure out the fringe spacing when the parts of the beam interfere. Um, you get this nice formula that involves the angle of the prism that you're working with, the refractive index of the prism, and the refractive index of the background. So if you measure the refractive index of the background with a different method, like ellipsometry, and then you add to it this measurement of the fringe spacing, you can figure out the refractive index of the region that you've written the prism in. And so this is what our old data looks like. Our new data, this is much cleaner. The fringes are perfectly uniform and, and they look much nicer. Um, simulated, this is what you expect. As a function of distance above the fringe or above the prism, you'd get these sort of cross-sectional profiles that are oscillatory. And you just measure the fringe spacing and that tells you the refractive index. Um, the measurement's a little bit uh, noisier. So from this, we can extract the refractive index and we can see the range of indices that are accessible. Um, the initial result back in 2020 was that we can tune from about 1.5 refractive index to 1.8. And if we don't write anything, we get an index of 1.3. So there's the continuous range, which is just 0.3 of refractive index that we can tune. And then there's this discrete total range of 0.6 that we can get for our index contrast in porous silicon. Um, and then this is just a replot of the previous graph of the voxel size. Um, so we have this widely tunable index range where we can basically get any arbitrary index in this range um, at any spatial location in our volume. And then if we oxidize, we get a slightly different range. The, the values are somewhat lower um, because the effective index for the porous silica is lower than for porous silicon. So in this case, we get a delta N of 0.4 and a continuous range of 0.2. Now you ask yourself, what happened here? Like, why can't we make uh, refractive indices in this in-between region? And the reason was the initial times that we were doing these types of measurements, um, we didn't understand all of the different ways that we have non-uniformities in the writing. And when you operate at this near threshold region, there's a very steep slope. And so most of the times when we were operating close to this region, we just weren't getting uniform poly uh, polymerization, and we just couldn't make prisms in that range. In a paper that should come out in the next month, month and a half, because it's under review right now, um, we show that we can extend this range all the way down to um, just like 0.03 or 0.04 above the background. So now essentially our continuous range is equal to our total range. So what are the limits on the writing? So the limits are basically, if you um, uh, look at the different materials that are involved, so the silicon by itself, these are at visible wavelengths. The silicon has refractive index of four, air has index of one. The polymer, if it's fully cross-linked, has index of 1.55. So based on that, if you have a certain porosity, you get a certain range of possible indices that you can achieve. Um, for example, this particular graph happens to be for a very high porosity sample. We typically don't make devices on samples this porous because the structure um, isn't as stable as it could be at lower porosities. And so if you have the porous film by itself, this is the, the dispersion curve. If you have a single monolayer, it goes slightly higher. And then if you're fully polymerized, you get the index that's closer to the value of the polymer, but it's slightly lower because um, you have this effective index type, um, type effect. So that's one limit is basically what are the constituents in your three, three object uh, mixture. The second is how deep can you write? So we're using 780 nanometer laser. Silicon itself is absorbing at 780. And so you have to think about how deep can you write in a porous film? So it's not as bad as absorbing in silicon, 
where if you went 30 microns, you'd fully absorb your light. Because it's only like 10 or 20% silicon, the absorption is a lot weaker than pure silicon. So we can write about 30 microns deep before the absorption significantly impacts the amount of laser power that we have. Um, if we write in porous silica, which is transparent, we can write arbitrary depths. Then it's only limited by how thick of a porous film we can make. The third limit for writing is the maximum threshold power or the, the threshold power and then the maximum power before bubbling. So for a given scan speed, these values change. If you write with too weak of a power, then the resist can't crosslink before it kind of just washes away. If you write with too high of a power, then you get bubbling and basically the film um, is low quality. So there's a range of powers for a given scan speed where you get nicely polymerized um, resist. Okay, so what can we do based on this? So one of the students in uh, Kimani Chisan's group used ZMAX to design this compound uh, doublet lens. And so ideally we want to create the crown and the flint such that we get achromatic focusing in the visible part of the spectrum. So I'll kind of skip this, <laughs> this actual design because the design <clears throat> is different than what we fabricated. We ended up changing things in the fabrication. These are kind of like old design graphs. So what did we achieve? So we made first, um, let, let me do the first one. Um, we first made a plano convex lens. And with the plano convex lens, we get this particular dispersion profile um, in which it's concavity, it's concave down as a function of wavelength. The next thing that we did is we looked at, okay, if we change this to a biconvex, what happens? And it turns out that because the material of both the lens that we write and the background material have their own dispersion properties, there is some sort of partial achromatic stuff that happens um, just by writing a biconvex lens. So this is a lot flatter than what we get from the plano convex, and that's because the background material is acting slightly like part of the achromat. So then when we write the doublet, where we have the two different refractive index profiles and they're designed to try to, to balance things out, we see that we can flip the sign of the concavity of the, the focal length. And so we're able to essentially, uh, with enough parameters fiddling around, um, we can design lenses that have arbitrary shape in the concavity of the focusing and essentially the flatness of it. Um, we also made um, what are called photonic nanojet generators. So these are structures that were initially coined back in 2004. Um, and it's actually known back in ancient Greek times that there's a saying that you shouldn't water your garden in the, in the, in the afternoon. And the reason is because the water droplets that sit on the plant leaves, um, the light from the sun um, focuses to a very tight spot on the backside surface of the, the water droplet, and you get burn marks on your plants from watering it in the afternoon. So this, this idea of this photonic nanojet generator, where you focus light into what's called the nanojet. The nanojet is a focused region where the focusing properties appear to defy the diffraction limit. They don't actually defy it, but it's um, essentially you get very tight focusing, for a longer distance than you expect from just conventional lenses. So these photonic nanojet generators, they're usually constructed by having some spherical surface and you're working in the near field region on the backside of the, the lens. So what we designed, um, so my postdoc and I back in 2016, was we designed, we proposed the structure, we had no way to fabricate it back then, um, which consists of a multimode interferometer. So this region, the light is a plane wave coming in. There's a multimode interferometer acting in this first distance R where you get a certain mode profile at this spot. And then it goes through this hemispherical surface and so you get some near field profile. You go through another multimode interferometer and then another focusing. And this sort of cascaded structure we showed in simulation can produce a photonic nanojet that can make very long focusing profile, like the simulation, like you can focus to almost a diffraction limited spot over the distance of about uh, one to two microns uh, for, for visible light, which is a lot longer than you'd expect. And this whole device, it's really an interference device, the way to think about it, rather than a geometrical focusing, because these dimensions are on the order of a few wavelengths. So these are like three microns in size, um, and the wavelength that we're working at is in the visible. 
So the structure, we can never fabricate it. It's like we proposed it and it's like, well, how do you make a structure with an air gap in it? And luckily for us, um, one of the students, Christian Osier, um, happened to read this paper and say, I think I have a way to fabricate it. And that's how we started our collaboration was the student read one of our papers and said, oh, this is an interesting device. I think I can fabricate this. So we, over a course of a few uh, years, figured out um, how to write this sort of structure how to create this sort of freestanding um, two lens object. This particular design has delta L equals zero. And so you get the simulated result and the measured result, and we get tight focusing over a reasonably large range. And it's different than if you just have a single one of these. If you have a single one of these, you don't get the right interference patterns and you end up with something that is, is much uh, larger in terms of its focus size. Okay, so those are um, the, the first set of devices. Those are geometrical optics. So the refractive index is constant. Now I wanna talk about some of the grin devices that we've made. So we've made these planar axicons where the refractive index is the highest in the center. And the goal is to create a Bessel-like function in the output. And so this is the multi-photon fluorescence image of this, just basically demonstrating we have higher polymer density in the center compared to the edge. So simulated and measured, we get reasonably good agreement in terms of the um, output intensity. Um, the spherical Lunenburg lens, that's probably the thing that I'm most excited about in the grin space is the ability to make the structure. Um, a Lunenburg lens is a lens such that if you have a collimated beam hitting it, um, it focuses exactly to the opposite diameter of the lens and you get a high numerical aperture. The numerical aperture is one over the square root of two. So you get NA of 0.7071. And the structure um, had not been previously demonstrated in the visible part of the spectrum or even the near infrared. Um, people had made this using metal lenses at the, um, I wanna say, it's been a while since I looked at this, but I think they made it at like six microns um, in, the, in the far infrared. And so our ability to be able to make graded refractive index, but over a very small diameter was what allowed us to make this very tiny Lunenburg lens. And with plane wave illumination from the backside for these two different wavelengths, we're getting full with half max that are expected based on the diffraction limit. Um, we get these very nice tight focusing uh, spots for this grin optic. Um, one of the other things that we did, which is really hard to see because of the lighting, um, we made this array of micro cylinder lenses. So um, the center is high refractive index, the edges are uh, weaker, and it's a cylinder that extends in the third dimension. And we wanted to see how uniform is the focusing profile in terms of as a function of distance along the pattern, are we getting the same focus? So I helped to collect this data. Um, so this was my design, that's why I'm the lead author in the paper. It's rare that faculty get to be the lead author, but this was a conference paper and I was like, let's design this. Okay, the students fabricated and then I went in the lab and I measured all of these. Um, measuring the 3D profile of the focusing of this grin array um, by scanning uh, in Z and taking these high resolution images, we can see that we have pretty uniform focusing across the entire array. It's a little bit weaker on the edge, um, but we have these 10 micron diameter uh, cylindrical lenses that have good uniform focusing. Um, so now I'll jump in and I'll talk about, and maybe I should ask, are there questions on the geometrical optics before I jump into photonics? Yes. You increase the depth of your direct rays by doing free photon absorption further into the red? Um, yeah, I think um, changing the wavelength would allow us to write um, with silicon, but it really depends on the resist properties, whether that uh, three photon absorption is uh, a process that's efficient for the type of resist that we have. So I, th I think it's possible. It's just what is the uh, nonlinear coefficient for the three photon process? Yeah. And how does it compare to the two photon? Right now, our solution is just um, run it at um, or, or use porous silica because then you don't have any issue. The other thing that we saw, and maybe I can jump back to this really quickly, um, the depth, or maybe I passed it, um, this depth, yeah. So we operate at 780, and you can see the absorption coefficient is 15. Just changing by 20 nanometers, like if we had an 800 nanometer source instead of 780, um, it's a factor of like 30% uh, less absorption. So that means we can go 30% deeper. If we went down to like maybe 850 or something, we probably get around this problem and get like three times as deep. So just very small changes in the, the wavelength that we use make a huge difference in how deep we can write. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
since you have like a limited voxel size, are you limited? Do you also get like unique scattering effects essentially from like the constructed lenses? From the constructed lenses? Yeah, from your lenses. Yeah, I mean, the voxels themselves are generally 150 by 150 by 500, but we do a method called multi pass writing, where the idea is you write the object and then you shift the stage by fractions of the mm -hmm. voxel size and you rewrite it. And if you do low enough power and write enough times, um, that's what we're, I'll show for the microring resonator. Um, we were able to get really high Q by doing that because the it's a discrete process where you're making individual voxels as it's writing because it's a femtosecond pulse and it, it's actually pulsing very fast. So it's like we're scanning at 10 millimeters per second and it's flashing as we're scanning and the individual flashes are actually about one nanometer apart. So it doesn't move by very much, but you still have the sort of discretization in the other two dimensions that it's not scanning over. So then you go back and you, you write the same region, but you shift slightly in X and Y and Z, and then you kind of smooth these things all out. Okay. There's also an effect where like you write the center at a certain power, and because it's a voxel where um, like if it's above the threshold, it'll write, but it depends on the power. The very center of the voxel has a higher index than the edges. So there is a lot of smoothing that happens. Like if I wrote a, if I wrote a single voxel, the very center of it might be fully polymerized, but then as you go in that 150 by 150 by 500, the, pol the polymer density will decrease as you go further away from the center of that. So if you wrote a single voxel, you'd essentially get a grin structure for your voxel. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so let me jump into uh, the passive volumetric photonic integrated circuits. Um, so we wanna be able to write waveguides. We wanna be able to write structures below the surface of the wafer um, where we can guide light. And so this idea of multi-pass where you write things many times, this was the first thing we tried, which is to write um, overlapping voxels to smooth out the shape. Um, we know each voxel is elliptical, mostly in Z. So if we wrote a bunch of voxels side by side, we should get something um, circular. And we do get something like that. We can also change the power. So we can write the very center voxel at higher intensity than we write the edges. We should get something that's a grin type waveguide where these dimensions are on the order of a micron in size because we wanna do this for telecom at 1550. Um, so our first set of devices, we made these three-dimensional waveguides. And this is one of the coolest figures, I think, in terms of what we've done. Um, so this is changing the Z position. So as I'm going, I'm going down and essentially making a tube. So it's bending as I go in Z, and then it moves along a constant plane of Z. And in that plane of Z, I can write a microring resonator, and I can create a gap that's on the order of 400 nanometers in size. So I can make the things that you typically think of on surface for the microring resonators and the waveguides. But now I'm writing this at a specific plane below in the wafer. I can actually write at any plane that I want. So I can make planes of photonic devices and each plane can couple light from one to the other. Cause I can take light and I can make a waveguide to take the light from one plane to the next. And I can have things that cross. So I have the two waveguides that are in different directions, but they're in different Z positions. So I can cross waveguides. I can make spaghetti um, if I want out of my 3D waveguide structures. So one thing to note with this initial set was we were doing something called longitudinal writing. Longitudinal writing means to write this waveguide, I'm basically drawing a line exactly like this. I come back and I draw a line exactly like this. And I keep drawing lines that go along the length of the waveguide. It turns out that that type of writing produces very rough sidewalls. So one of the things that we learned in future experiments and what's one of the key um, conclusions of the paper that we're still working on that we're very close to, to having the figures for to submit is that instead of writing like this, which is what you'd think would give you the lowest loss, um, writing the lines of the waveguide like this, so you'd write the waveguide perpendicular to the waveguide, that actually has lower loss. And the reason is that it doesn't depend on how long of a waveguide that I write. Every single thing that I write, there's the same time delay between what I write. So it turns out that the time delay between when you write in one region and when you come back and write again, that affects the polymerization process and that affects the uniformity of something. So if I wrote a line of one unit length and I wrote something of two unit lengths, that rewriting process is different if I do longitudinal writing, but if I do transverse writing, the time between each section of this transverse writing is the same and I get smoother waveguides. It, it, it baffled my, my mind that writing in this direction, I would imagine that the sidewall roughness would be worse, but it turns out it's, it's much better. 
So these first set were longitudinally written. So these are the resonances that we got from our microring uh, resonator. Um, we have a fiber which has nine micron diameter mode. We're coupling into a waveguide that's one micron, and we have nothing that's changing the mode in between. So we have huge amounts lost because you have this huge mode mismatch, nine micron diameter fiber, um, one micron waveguide. And so we have 50 dB of loss, but we get these nice transmission dips. And the quality factor for these initial mic rings was on the order of 3000. So we demonstrated we can make mic ring resonators um, below the surface of the waveguide or the, of the chip. And we can get um, under or overcoupled and undercoupled uh, devices. So the first obvious thing is, okay, we've made lenses, we've made waveguides. Why don't we put the lenses on top of the waveguides to do a mode conversion between the fibers uh, 10 micron mode field diameter and the waveguides one and a half mode field or micron mode field diameter. So just by doing this, we improved our coupling loss, essentially going from fiber through the waveguide back to fiber again um, by 40 dB. So it's like 40 dB improvement compared to a published result. Um, we really should have published a result right after that, but we've just kept working and working and we've improved it further, but we should have published it back then. Anyway, so we have 12 dB of loss or 11 dB of loss, depending on how you measure it. Um, and we have micro rings that have comparable Q to the previous, um, previous case. So we make other devices like a uh, conventional mock sender. So we have the lens, we have the waveguide, we split the light for the two waveguides, we interfere. So we get the standard mock sender. The mock sender is useful for measuring the group index of the waveguide. Um, and so we can figure out that based on the free spectral range. We can also make distributed Bragg reflectors. So as you're writing, um, you just change the laser power that you're writing periodically. And so you can make this Bragg reflector. Um, and so from that Bragg reflector, based on the center wavelength, you can figure out the effective index of the Bragg grading. Um, so these are ways that we can measure index or indices of the, of the waveguide structures. So one of the big things that we've been working on for the, the, the whole time is how do we push the loss? Because even 11 dB of loss, that's not gonna be practical for a, a system. So what we did is we have been essentially doing our own version of Moore's law, where the students are working on one specific problem. And by working on one specific problem, every certain amount of time, you get a 2x improvement because you're working on one specific thing. So what we've started off with was this 50 dB result back in mid-2019. Um, and the reason it was so high is that we had the poor mode size mismatch between the fiber and the waveguide. Also the angle, we didn't do a lot of angular alignment. So the first thing we did was added these nine micron lenses. We switched to transverse writing, which I mentioned is lower propagation loss. And that got us to this 11 dB number. The next thing that we did is we realized we have these mechanical stages and we're just moving fibers and we're manually trying to align the fiber to the waveguide. So let's get automated or motorized uh, uh, translation and rotation stages that do a little bit better job. Also, when we write, we want to do um, this multi-pass. So the idea of writing the same thing multiple times, that reduces the propagation loss. So we did that. We also uh, put on the waveguides, um, let me show back here. Um, on the tip of the waveguide, the problem is the divergence angle of this waveguide coming out is too large, even for, well, we did plain lenses. We didn't do Lunenburg lenses. So these have a numerical aperture of about 0.58. These ones I think are, uh, the divergence is like 0.9. So we lose a lot of power just going around the lens. So what we did was we taper the refractive index from its uh, fully polymerized value to a lower value. And that tapering essentially expands the mode and it reduces the numerical aperture coming out of the, the waveguide. So that allows the lens to capture more of the light. So we taper the tips. It also reduces the reflection um, and that got us to 6 dB. Um, we also realized that our angles are still not good enough. So we added more motorized <laughs> components in our stage. Um, we had these two improvements there. And then we also changed the way that we write the discretization of the voxels and so forth. Um, and we, so right now we're at 2.3 dB of insertion loss. And this is relatively broadband. It's based on how wide of a laser uh, scan range that we had available to us. So um, we've also done OSA measurements um, where from 1280 to 1650, we're at the ba basically the same amount of loss. Um, the high frequency oscillations are because um, the fiber that's coming down to couple in, we have no anti-reflection coating on the fiber. So we have a cavity that's going from the fiber here 
through the device and then back to the other end's fiber. So that's what this high frequency oscillation is. And then the low frequency oscillation is because there is, um, uh, I'm, oh, sorry, the high frequency oscillation is the fiber and then the, the, the surface, that, that small cavity produces high frequency oscillation. The low frequency oscillation, this stuff, that's going through the device and reflecting from the cavity from the two fibers. So we do all this sort of analysis on the transmission and reflection spectra. We can figure out the cavities that are involved and the optical path lengths, and then we can work on what can we improve. So right now we're at 2.3 dB of loss. Out of that, we calculated based on our microrings uh, resonators Q that we have propagation loss on the order of 3 dB per centimeter. When we write, we can't write the entire thing with a single move. Like we have to, we have to write part of the waveguide, translate the sample, write the rest of the waveguide, translate the sample. So there's two stitches in the writing process. We multipass to reduce the amount of loss from the stitch. And so the stitches are about 0.2 dB. And then the reflection is about 0.8 dB. And we think that we still don't have the angular alignment perfect. And that's about 1.2 dB. So we think we understand where the remaining sources of loss are. Um, these are some of the microrings that we've demonstrated more recently. Um, these have cues on the order of 40,000. We also have data, which I didn't update the slide for, but it was 60,000. Looks the same, but just slightly narrower. Um, and we can get these nice, uh, high quality uh, microring resonators below the surface. So now I want to uh, give an outlook like, okay, so we've demonstrated uh, subsurface micro optic devices, RIN devices, um, uh, waveguide devices. Where do we want to take this technology? So our ultimate goal is to get to, I think my laser's dying. Um, our ultimate goal is to get to these volumetric photonic integrated circuits. This vision of diffractive optical elements that couple to lasers, that have waveguides, that have 3D interconnects, that have the spaghetti to be able to route light in different places. So in order for us to do this, there are 10 steps. We wanna make novel types of devices. We've pretty much done this. We've made a lot of different types of devices that can only be made with the sort of grin writing capability. We wanna make passive devices. So we've done a lot of these where you wanna make um, standard devices that you think of that exist on the surface, just make volumetric versions of them. We wanna make uh, combinations of things. So combine diffractive optical elements with reflective elements with um, refractive elements be able to do mode division multiplexing, have lenses and waveguides together. So we've done quite a lot of step three as well. Step four is to make these optical interconnect links. So we've actually done quite a bit. We've demonstrated 2.3 dB of loss. We can take light from one plane and escalate it to a different plane. We have almost optimized fiber to chip coupling. One thing that we wanna work on still is we have light in, our, in this porous silicon chip. How do we get the light from that chip into something like lithium nibate or into a 3.5 material um, so that we can integrate with other photonic technologies? And then one of the key things that we're currently working on is how can we make active devices inside our pores? So can we make a modulator? Can we make a photo detector? Can we make a switch um, inside our material either by embedding materials that have quantum dots or that have dyes or that have some other active property into our pores? And then we've done a lot of the modeling to be able to understand for given laser power, how do we get the index that we want? And also what type of performance our devices will have if we can fabricate it. Steps seven through 10 are things that are done for industry. It's basically, we've demonstrated that this is a really great technology. How can we make these things more manufacturable? The biggest element or the biggest obstacle right now is the throughput. So it's a serial laser writing process. The whole thing to write 400 devices on a chip, which is our typical thing, um, takes 24 hours of writing. So it's not scalable. You make one chip a day and it's not gonna commercialize. So how can we get so that, and it's also one square centimeter in size. How can we make these sorts of things written on eight inch wafers, on 12 inch wafers, where we're doing things in parallel, um, either not doing a direct laser write process and doing some other method to get the same effect, but in parallel, um, or figuring out how to write with thousands of heads at the same time um, or doing some other method. Um, how do we integrate this with CMOS? So all these really great photonic devices, we wanna be able to connect them to electronic devices. Um, what are the, rep the repeatability and the um, uh, reliability of the devices? So have people done age testing, 85 degrees C, 85% humidity? How do the devices stand up? 
Um, we know that the resists and the index are very stable with temperature. So we've tested at 150 degrees for a few weeks and we get the same refractive index for the prism. So the, the, the polymer is fine with different temperature, but we haven't built a setup to do high humidity and high temperature. So we don't know how water vapor getting in will influence the device performance. And then the last step, so a lot of this is modeled after AIM Photonics and what they do, like they have foundry process, uh, process development kits so that people who wanna use this technology don't have to understand the physics, they can just plop in certain designs and have simulation models be able to run on their structures. So that's our vision and our roadmap to get to these volumetric photonic integrated circuits. So in conclusion, um, I've presented a new method called SCRIBE, so the subsurface controllable refractive index via beam exposure. We can write these three-dimensional structures. The, actually, this is the old data. The old data, the continuous range was 0.38. Um, currently, it's closer to like, actually, no, this is the new data. So we can write from 1.15 to 1.55 refractive index. Um, the way it works is we control the filling fraction inside our nanoporous scaffolds. Um, we realize all sorts of interesting optics and we're excited to work and collaborate with you to come up with applications. So how can we use these grin devices to make something more practical than just a demo? Like we can focus really tightly, okay? How can we put this into application use? Um, so all sorts of uh, micro optic devices and photonic devices as well. And right now we're really ready for industrial collaboration and targeted R&D. So trying to find um, ways that we can commercialize this in a foundry type process so that other researchers can use it. And then how can we continue to scale our uh, optical interconnects so that the loss goes down and the port count goes up so we can have many devices. Right now we can test, I think four devices in parallel because we have a nine channel fiber array. So we can test four things in parallel, but we wanna be able to have hundreds of inputs and hundreds of outputs. And then how do we integrate this with active devices so that we can form a full interconnect system? Because that's our vision in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so this work was initially funded from a strategic research initiative, internal funds from our College of Engineering. And then we had a NSF grant um, from 2019 to 2022 that we just finished that had a lot of the support for this work. So with that, um, thank you for your time and attention and feel free to ask more questions. Yes. Uh, awesome talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so there's been a lot of excitement in uh, nonlinear optics and multimode grid fibers mm -hmm. because you get these kind of new effects. One example is you put in a multimode beam as long as it's coherent, and it'll condense down to a Gaussian no matter mm -hmm. what the input is. Okay. So people have done this in fiber because they're in fibers, but in like a photonic integrated structure. There's no demonstration. That's probably because you could do discrete contrast refractive indices, but not gradient index structures. Mm -hmm. So just thought it's called beam self-cleaning. Beam self-cleaning. Okay. Maybe I can follow up with you via email. Yeah, send me send me an email about it. So the is the key thing that the material has to have strong nonlinearity or no. just that it needs a grin profile? It, I mean, as long as it has weak current nonlinearity. Oh, this has all been done. In weak silica. kernel. So it's all been done in silica, usually okay. just standard silica fiber. But the the important point is a uh, is gradient index. You know, you have like a circular waveguide, and just having controllable index gradient radially mm -hmm. is what what gives you the the effect. And the reason that it tends to be collapsing down to the fundamental is just the fundamental has the it, highest. It's a parabolic grin profile. Okay. So uh, if you if you construct a different index gradient, you can get it to go to different modes as long as they're relatively low order, too. So cool. It's kind of I'll follow up with you. Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to learn more about it. And I, I think the ways to get to the nonlinearity, I'm thinking about the microring resonator, because the microring resonator, you can increase the quality factor and get to the nonlinearity much easier. Yeah. Yes. On the other end of the spectrum, as someone who knows very little about waveguides or, or nonlinear optics, um, I thought it was cool that I appreciated the waveguide stuff probably as much as the geometrical optics. But I had a couple of questions about um, the way that you're fabricating these. If there's, so the, the limitation on the thickness of these right now is the silicon wafer 
thickness if I wanted um, to make like a few millimeter thick? The limitation is the porosification step. So we start off with 100 micron thick silicon. Um, we could start off with thicker silicon. Um, as you porosify and go down, um, the question is, so technically the structure is actually unstable. So there's a theory that says, um, if you have a random distribution um, and certain porosity, if it's above, I think, 50 something percent, um, it should collapse. But because the structures have a little bit of structure to them, because there's this vertical connection, the pores are mostly vertical, we can get higher porosities. So it's a question about how thick can you create these pores and still get the sample out of the fluid without the whole thing washing away <laughs> and without the stress, because there's also stress um, without the stress of the film, especially if you oxidize it from causing it to warp or crack. Yeah. You make, you like stack them. Yeah, you can, you can make films and you can stack. The challenge is the interface between the two films. It may have air gaps. So when we transfer from one to the another, uh, one substrate to another, it's not clear that we have essentially perfect atomic layer sticking from one to the other. There may be tiny air spaces. Which for a like macro scale geometrical optics thing might not matter as much as like a waveguide kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So the, the other thing that we've looked at, so we have this great idea. People have aerogels. Can't we just put the polymer in the aerogel? The whole thing collapses. So we tried this aerogel and put the, the polymer in the vacuum casting. It just makes debris. So there, there has to be enough structure to hold together the, the mesoporous structure. Um, and it has to survive the forces of when you cross-link, it changes the, um, the stress in the structure. Um, and then you have to wash out. So all of those steps have to survive. So it's a fragile. Yeah, it's very fragile, but once it's made, um, it's not that fragile. Um, I think it's during the processing steps because it's going in liquid. I think it's getting, so we do a super critical drying step because we have to get the liquid out without um, essentially tearing stuff apart. So once it's fabricated, it's stable, but while you're fabricating it, you have to be very careful with the steps. And then a second question was, there were a couple of slides about the, uh, the index change for the porous silica and silicon mm -hmm. um, at three wavelengths. Have mm -hmm. you, have you met, tried to measure if the dispersion is changing with power also? So you're talking about like this curve, for example? Yeah, like you can kind of see that the blue maybe gets closer to the green at higher power. Yeah, so we've, um, we also have measured this in the infrared and I don't have, I think I have one graph. I think it's this graph. Um, so you can kind of see like this, pretty much stabilizes. And um, we have some other ones where it's a lot flatter than this. So I'm trying to remember um, why this one had such a large dispersion. Because the thing that I remember from, uh, we tried an experiment running from like 600 to 1700 nanometers. And there was almost no change in the refractive index of our, of our structure over that range. It was like in the second decimal or third decimal place. So um, this particular data, it's, it's highly dispersive, but then this part is just really, really flat. You're welcome. Yes. I was wondering how focusing through this porous structure affects your beam quality. And if you see a, like as you go to deeper and deeper um, layers, if that focusing quality decreases. Yeah, so um, it does get impacted. So in the ideal case where we're working with porous silica, so it's transparent, um, most of the material is liquid. So it's, it's mostly the index of the polymer. The index of the polymer is actually close to the index of the porous silica. So the polymer, when it's uncross-linked, it's 1.51. Um, when it's cross-linked, I think it's 1.55. And then the, the scaffold, which is the, um, the porous silica. So the silica, the index is 1.44. So it's actually very little index contrast between the scaffold and the polymer um, when, when you're writing it. But some of the things that we've been able to demonstrate, which is kind of surprising, we write our lens. Um, so when we write the waveguides, it's, it's kind of an interesting structure. Um, we always want the stages to move in the forward direction because there's some backlash and that messes up some of the alignment. So when we write it, we write going down across and then up, then we write this lens, and then we write that lens. And it's interesting in that um, we've also done it where we write this lens first, and then write this, and then write this lens. 
um, those two devices actually have almost the same exact loss. So even though we've cross-linked um, polymer and we've made a lens, we can still write waveguides under it and it's almost no different. Yeah. So that was a surprise is we thought we always have to write from the bottom to the top, but you can write stuff underneath. It probably is affected, but the index contrast is so small that it's not that noticeable. Sure. Describe mine. Are they like supportive of you like hacking their stuff, or are they? Um, like, we're using know? we're using it as it's designed, except the only different. Oh, you mean using the name or? No, no, no. The so you're you're using their like polymer liquid. Or yeah, something? we're using their proprietary resist, and they're supportive because um, we're demonstrating an additional use because their yeah. tool they pretty much only use for writing above surface. And pretty much all the researchers only use it for writing above surface. So this is just another application of their tools. So they're they're excited about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they were smart about it, they would be. Inspired. They should be. They should be funding us because we're. <laughs> so the, the paper that we're about to publish it basically explains how you can calibrate their system to get better performance than what it currently has. So I mean, this is like development work that we're doing for free um, for them. And you're marketing half their name already. It's exactly. <laughs> so could you like make your own liquids? Yeah. So um, so there are other there are a lot of other resist materials, and so there's trade offs between like the properties, like is it high index contrast? What's the porosity? What's the cross linking power? People are looking at resists that can be able to um, write with um, a linear. So instead of having to do femtosecond laser writing. Um, write using 405 nanometers, but using a virtual state instead of a two photon, or sorry, using a real state instead of using a two photon step with a virtual state. So this, um, this real state in between allows you to get a nonlinear process at much lower power with just a simple CW laser. So there are people who are looking at that um, as a way to um, increase the speed of this writing because now you can make um, really cheap, uh, 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 large area writing structures. Like the 3D printers that like project like a picture. Yeah, instead of just single beam. Yeah. And you get to use your blue uh, laser scan. Yeah, I get to go back to... <laughs> so, you had a question. My question was similar, just like how limited are you by what material, like what polymer materials red has? Like are there... Yeah. Well, we can use whatever res we can use whatever resist we want. Um, but they say with their tool that if we damage their objective, then they're not going to be responsible for it. Um, we've started building sort of our own simple version. It's not using the two photon. It's using the the blue approach. Um, so there was a paper that came out a year and a half ago where where they're trying to do this linear or the single uh, what I forgot what it's called um, two step absorption. So it's a two step process. So it's nonlinear but it uses uh, lower cost uh, optics. And so we're trying to build our own version of that because we think that's a direction that it, it can go. Have you ever looked at any kind of like self-writing waveguides or like materials for that? Process? Where you essentially propagate a beam and as, as it's going, it writes- Start the it and then shoot another beam in to <laughs> continue. Yeah, we've, I've, I've thought about that. I think the challenge is um, how do you get it to turn? So like you can get it to go straight once you start it, but then maybe you have to come with the original beam and write the rest of it. You know. Yes. You mentioned for scanning across, like if you're using micro positioner, is that correct? Um, so there's a, it's kind of two things. So there's a Galvo stage, which, yeah, the Galvo is what we do for most of the writing, which allows us to scan the beam at 10 millimeters per second. But the Galvo can only write a hundred micron uh, diameter circle. So then, if we want to write a waveguide, which is uh, 250 microns apart from the input and the output because of the fiber array pitch that is standard for industry, um, we write within a Galvo region, and then we have to use the piezo to move. I think it moves the sample. Yeah, it moves the sample in X and Y, um, and then we write the rest of the waveguide. And then if we need to move more than, I think it's 500 microns, then there's a, uh, a, a separate stage which moves a lot slower and has less uh, accuracy. And that's all inside the NanoScribe tool itself. Okay. Were there any online questions? Uh, nothing in the chat. How many people are on, on online? Um, right now, just the two of us, but so earlier there were Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Glad people were able to, to join. Oh, another uh, question. Too many questions for I, me. I was, I was looking at myself in the video. 
house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we can wrap things up. Thank All you right. again.